welcome to this keynote panel, Culture Who Pays, which is an issue very close to my heart, even if it's not close to the heart of huge numbers of people uh, at this festival. But we should take this opportunity, because we've got a brilliant panel, of digging deep into this issue. I think that we do face an interesting dilemma, those of us who are interested in the arts at the moment, of whether the arts are just a kind of frivolous uh, extra and in a period of austerity when there's not much money around whether they are easily dispensed with and certainly there's discussions <coughs> like that that go on all the time um, in relation to councils and uh, local government as something uh, that I, I, I kind of write about uh, in one of, one of my uh, hats. But it was interesting when the new v &A opened in Dundee, which I think is referred to in the, uh, uh, in the blurb, that one of the council leader, John Alexander, said that the new v &A was putting fire in the belly of the city's people and boosting their confidence after decades of economic decline. But then when you, know, you kind of d dug a bit deeper, you discovered that there was actually quite a lot of resentment amongst some groups in Dundee at all at the £80 million costs, the going over budget, the uh, revelation that it was going to cost another £1.7 million annually to maintain and so on. It's like, who's going to pay for that in a city that suffered some considerable economic uh, hardship over the years? So just those kind of discussions are very important. Also, the people who were at the opening of the festival will have heard Nick Kenyon, who is the managing director of the Barbican, talk about the very place that we're in, not so much even the Barbican, but the City of London. And the City of London Corporation are keen to, if you want, say we're more than just the place that you associate with banks and so on, we're also setting up this culture mile and that gathering together all the cultural and arts organisations is possibly something Sean might refer to, but mm -hmm. it's just kind of like the arts are, on the one hand, seen as something that's good to be associated with, but it's, never, it's not entirely clear who's going to pay for it all, and, and, and that's part of it. But it's not just a kind of money uh, uh, conversation. I suppose it's what are the arts worth for us. Uh, well, we're approaching the 25th anniversary of the uh, National Lottery, and... Uh, Camelot are the uh, headline sponsor of this festival and specifically uh, associated with this session because lottery money has been used in many instances to add on funding for extra arts projects. But there's a big argument about whether it's going to be used by the government to subsidise or substitute uh, public money. Um, and then some people say, well, that's just like a tax on the poor. And it's not fair to kind of have to get people who are buying their lottery tickets in Tesco to be the people who are paying for some people to go to the opera. So these are the kind of issues that I think it's worth considering. And there are real dilemmas around what are the arts worth, who should subsidise them, if anyone, whether certain art forms are given more money than they should get that are only for the rich and the elite, all of those kind of questions, also corporate sponsorship, whether it comes with strings and so on. Big example of that recently when uh, there was an objection to BAE giving uh, a big grant to the Northern Exhibition because they were an arms manufacturer and so eventually that they pulled out the money, which was fine, but it didn't help the exhibition. And so you kind of like you end up with this situation all the time. So let me introduce the panel in the order in which they'll speak. We're going to start... Uh, when we hear from uh, Dr. Tiffany Jenkins, who's a writer and broadcaster, author of the critically acclaimed Keeping Their Marbles, How Treasures of the Past Ended Up in Museums and Why They Should Stay There, which is a literal title of a very brilliant <laughs> book, um, which has actually had influence, I think, internationally. Tiff is an honorary fellow in the Department of Art History at the University of Edinburgh, broadcaster regularly on uh, arts programmes, she wrote and presented the Na A Narrative History of Secrecy on Radio 4 recently, which was a, a totally brilliant uh, listen, as far as I was concerned. Um, and we're delighted to have her with us. She's a regular at the Battle of Ideas. Give her a warm welcome, please. We've got, we're then going to hear from Sean Gregory, who is the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Barbican Centre in the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, and effectively our host. And Sean is the person who has ensured that we are as the Battle of Ideas, this is our 
home and has been for eight years now, and it's always uh, brilliant working with him. But Sean himself is responsible for developing and delivering a range of world-class creative learning programs in music, theatre, visual arts, cinema, dance and literature here um, at the Barbican and at the Guild Hall. He's also personally a composer, a performer, and has collaborated on arts projects for all ages and abilities in association with everyone from orchestras to opera companies, uh, theatres, galleries, and so on. You know, he's at the, right at the heart of the kind of institutional, how do we make sure that arts is valuable and how do we get people to understand what is at stake? So can we give Sean a warm welcome, please? We've got uh, Barb Younger sitting next to me. Um, I'm so delighted to have Barb with us and back. She's spoken at the battle before, but uh, we, we missed her for a couple of years. Barb, many of you will know, is an award-winning singer, songwriter, composer, writer, and arts broadcaster, critically lauded for her insightful and passionate interpretations, described as revelatory by the uh, uh, New York Times. She deconstructs and reconstructs popular songs and is particularly associated with having done that in relation to Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, Nina Simone, and Jack Brell. She's got 18 solo albums with Lynn Records. I've got most of them. She also writes for the theatre um, and is written for Polka and Little Angel Theatre. And she also co-wrote uh, the songs and the book for Liver Birds Flying Home for the Royal Court Liverpool. I did get very excited when I heard this and kept saying, she's doing the Liver Birds. And of course, nobody in my office knew what the Liver Birds So there is a generational <laughs> matter. There is a generational matter. But for me, <coughs> this was an exciting moment. Fantastic performer. And not only is she a passionate interpreter of song, but also passionately involved in thinking about the importance of the arts. And I'm looking forward to hearing what she's got to say. Give her a warm welcome. <laughs> and, and last but not least, we've got Alexander Adams. Alexander is an artist, writer, and art critic. His book, Culture War, Art, Identity, Politics, and Cultural Entryism, will be out in the spring next year. And I'm sure that hopefully you'll be back next year to talk about that. And, and, and he will be signing his book but next year. Um, uh, he's a professional artist and is exhibited worldwide. His art is actually in the v and uh, in the National Museum of Wales. He also uh, has poetry and fiction published both in the UK and the USA. And his cultural criticism appears in the art newspaper, Apollo, Burlington Magazine, uh, Spiked and Print Quarterly. And I'm delighted to have him uh, with us this year. I, I just listened to an interview with him uh, um, on the arts, and it was, I just was, spent an hour thoroughly enjoying it, nodding and disagreeing, and nodding and disagreeing all the way through. Um, so I'm looking forward to his provocations. Can we give him a warm welcome, please? <laughs> OK, the format is that we'll have the, our speakers to speak for between five and seven minutes each, uh, then we'll have an open discussion with the audience. Um, OK, Tiff, thanks. Thanks, Claire. Um, before we consider who pays, I want to uh, reflect for a moment on why why, why pay? I think one way of doing that is just to think for a moment when it was and what the experience was like when you last encountered something that you thought was great. Um, it could be anything, it could be sculpture, a symphony, a tune on the radio, um, and how that felt. Um, for me, um, I see a lot of stuff. Not everything is great, many just pass the time. But I went to the Rodin exhibition at the British Museum where you had the comparison of Rodin's work with the Parthenon. I do a lot of writing on the Parthenon and I saw this initially as a kind of politically motivated exhibition, one with which I would agree, but one that was designed to show that the BM was the best place for the Parthenon. But in fact, it was proven to be the case, I thought. What you had was, uh, I saw afresh these sculptures which were are two and a half thousand years old, weren't sculpted for a museum, weren't sculpted for a, an art gallery. We don't even know really what they were sculpted for. There's no kind of very few sources on them. In comparison with this funny guy, Rodin, who's inspired by them and afresh considers sculpture, whether it's the kiss, which is a little bit um, lumpen in my view, but nonetheless, uh, a lot of his work, particularly the Burgers of Calais, I think, um, really up, up sort of prefigure a lot of the German Expressionism. It was an outstanding exhibition, and as you went in, 
there was this moment of silence and stillness. And as you all probably go to exhibitions, you know that's actually quite rare. They, they're usually very, very busy, lots of talking, everybody kind of talking about either their breakfast or what they see in front of them. But this was quiet. And it was one of those hair-raising moments. And I thought, there's no other way that this experience could be conveyed other than through these objects. They are standalone, unique things. I couldn't read a book, I couldn't listen to something, a lecture on the radio. There was no other way that these things could kind of be communicated. So they were a standalone, arresting um, pieces which lifted the heart. There's no other way to describe it. It was a kind of a moment, a kind of moment of transcendence. There are other things about it that I thought were very interesting. This is a 19th century sculpture, sculptor talking, if you like, to somebody and many and the, and the artists from two and a half thousand years ago in a 21st century gallery. So there's this kind of conversation between generations, conversation about movement, about war, about love, um, ephemeral slightly, intangible, but nonetheless the things that I think make us human. And that for me was why we would perhaps pay for culture. Um, it does something that nothing else can do. And we are more than animals. We, um, we need our food, we need our shelter, we need to be cared for. Um, we need to be mended and fixed when we break things. But there's also something, whether it's a soul or something that we um, describe in many ways, but which is essentially human, that I think the arts kind of speak to. They provide solace um, and they provide uplift. So that's why I think they should be funded. Um, I think there are a number of limitations in the way we talk about art and funding today that hampers the funding of the arts and I want to talk about them now. Now Claire introduced this by talking about shifts in the economy and yes there has been a profound recession which doesn't look like it's going away any uh, anytime soon um, but even before that in a time of plenty, particularly under here the Labour government, there was quite a fair bit of money for the arts. But I think there were still the same problems that face us today, um, if perhaps in a less acute form. So my point is that although this discussion may be triggered, if you like, by the recession and the fallout from that, um, the problems facing arts and arts funding happen prior to that. The first I would describe as, if you like, a kind of inability to discuss art and this might seem paradoxical because the arts are used in discussion a lot labor called them the centers of social inclusion and prioritized them in funding um, we are often taught we are often we often hear about uh, various cities of culture and there are many cultural prizes so on the one hand it seems to be that there is a lot of discussion about culture but i think more difficult is quality kind of aesthetic judgment um, I think we need a little bit more of that. And I don't think we need to get our cant out and kind of become, you know, rarefied seats. Um, I think just a kind of critical, open, a public conversation about cultural value and judgment. What is good? Why is it good? Uh, why is this better than something else? How does it compare to that which came before it? Um, I think that is essential both to respecting what came before us but also understanding it in order to move on to something new. So it's not just a question of conservation and tradition, it's about how do we facilitate new and uh, future artists, give them the kind of, the, the aesthetic eye that they need to springboard onto something new. So that crisis of judgment, I think, prefigures the discussion around who funds art. In its place, if you go to many discussions about arts funding, you get something else um, that's proposed as a reason to fund the arts. You get two things. One is the kind of utilitarian. We fund it because it, it regenerates the area. Um, it raises self-esteem. Um, that you get far more, actually, than the discussion about the arts contributing to the economy. And that's quite interesting in relation to the opening of the V&A in Dundee. It's great. I mean, there are problems with the building, but it's still a pretty good building. And Dundee is lifted by it, but not on its own. Um, it's a very innovative place for design, that you've got Rockstar Games there. So there, there's a kind of, there's a number of things happening in Dundee that this helps to 
reinforce. What was notable for me uh, in the opening was that no, although there were quite a lot of conversations in the press about the building, as you would expect, nobody talked about what was inside it. Um, it is limited in its collection, but I'll just tell you about this one tiara that you get. There's a kind of tiara from the 1930s. Uh, two and a half thousand diamonds make up this tiara, and it's got little wings on its side. And they gently, ever so gently, when you walk with this tiara on, and I don't, haven't tried it, unfortunately, but you can see it in the case, they sort of vibrate, and it's almost like you're a, I don't know, a fairy or something. Anyway, it's fabulous. Point being, there's quite a lot to discuss in terms of what's in there, in terms of design. It could have quite a um, direct contribution to the designers who are in Dundee, but that also wasn't discussed. It was all about whether, who was going, audiences. Now, no artist doesn't want an audience. Every artist wants an audience. But you've got to have a little bit, you've got to be able to talk about the quality. I've just been given one minute to sum up, up, sum up. So I will talk about the second reason that I think discussions about arts funding are hampered and limited. And that is this kind of moral purification of the arts that you're seeing. Now, this week, it's taken the form of any funds that go from Saudi Arabia to arts organisations. Today in Brooklyn, at Brooklyn Museum, you're, they're going to be opening up an uh, exhibition on artefacts from Syria, which is funded by many, many, many um, organisations in the Middle East with ties or who are funded by the Saudi government. And with the death of the journalists this week, many arts organisations are feeling A, uncomfortable, and the heat. They are feeling the heat. Um, I would worry about the kind of moral purification um, <clears throat> argument that you can't, you, nothing, nothing which could be questionable in terms of whether it's BP or other associations with your sponsor can be taken. Because I think the arts need, and this is my final part, the arts need, as well as the discussion about critical judgment, you need funding from the state the public, at corporations, and anywhere. But it's a multiplicity of funding that you require. But first, we need to talk about the art. Okay. Thank you. Uh, great start, Tiff. Uh, sorry for hurrying you. OK, um, so, Sean. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, in terms of the value of culture, speaking as a musician and someone who's worked as a composer for many years, particularly in my earlier years, uh, the value of culture and the importance of investing in it, not in terms of art, only in terms of art for art's sake, music for music's sake, but the impact it can have on people, in communities, in schools, in all walks of life, through participating in it as much as consuming it, is paramount for me. Um, but for this particular moment, I'm going to um, focus more on how we're grappling with this issue from an organisational point of view, particularly with my sort of Barbican and Guildhall school hat on. So culture who pays? The funding for culture has made significant shifts, arguably, over the past decade or so. No longer reliant on just public subsidy, it has become part of a mixed economy and ecology. One could argue that over the past 10 years, we've seen the positive impact of this country's cultural and creative achievements. For example, we've given growing national and we have a growing national and international reputation for the quality and innovation of our cultural industries including our publicly funded cultural organizations around the country we have cultural buildings and the associated skills that are better able to meet the complex demands of our creative talent as well as being more attractive and accessible for audiences and arguably Again, as a result, many cities and towns across England have a strengthened cultural offer compared with a decade ago. I'm not saying that as a blanket statement, but be it through pockets or particular cities or areas and through initiatives, initiatives like City of Culture or the Arts Council People and Places and Cultural Education Partnerships, there is more engagement. Whether it's working or not in a sustained and meaningful way, I think is still out, out for the count, as it were, out for the jury. These achievements have come about through sustained revenue and capital investments by not only from one source, by national and local partnerships, including local governments, higher and further education, local enterprises, individual giving, sponsorship, trusts and foundations, of course the Arts Council and the Lottery, and so on. I would say it is very rare, if at all, for new commissions, major cultural projects, initiatives, and indeed new buildings to be funded through one source 
particularly a government source, let alone a public, publicly funded one. Culture, of course, means different things to different people, and creativity can be expressed in many ways, and I think Tiffany gave some excellent examples around that. For the Barbican, our expression of it through our mission is arts without boundaries. We want to program work of the highest quality. We want it to be challenging. We want it to be entertaining. We want people to be pushed but, uh, and challenged, of course, but also to be there for enjoyment and feel it's accessible. And we want it to be world class. Nothing new in that. We all talk about being world class, the best, top quality, excellent. But we all strive for that and we must keep striving for that and we must keep interrogating what we mean by of the highest quality, that it's excellent, that's world leading, and that's relevant to what people want, um, and that remains radical and different where appropriate. And I would also say we're, we're setting um, increasingly that our notion of arts without boundaries and all those things I've just said, not only within the context of the Barbican, again, it's back to this not doing it in isolation. We are doing this in partnership and through building relationships with other people and organizations not least an art centre working with a conservatoire next door, which is training the artists of the future, one could argue, and practitioners of the future. But also in this more immediate area, we talk of this area now as a culture mile. It's a cultural hub, a cultural district. Nothing new in that, of course. There's plenty of them in London, let alone around the rest of the country. Again, there's a whole debate about, had around that, about who those are for. But what it is doing, dare I say, speaking from the inside, is it's challenging our own assumptions about how we program things, how we prioritise things, and of course, how we set our economic models at play so that we can do things. Um, and also, the other thing I want to say is we, we, we have to, as many venues, I think all venues and organisations do, get beyond thinking about just programming in the venues ourselves, whether it's what happens in here, as one of our cinemas, in a concert hall, in the theatre. That, of course, has to be keep, keep being excellent. We have to keep bringing audiences in. We want to grow and develop those audiences coming to see particular pieces of work, theatre, art, whatever. But also, it's what we programme in the spaces between, in the foyers, outside, around this area, out into the East London community, where we've worked with for over 30 years, uh, building different sorts of relationships. And when putting things on there, not just parachuting them in, building them up from the ground up so that they are sustainable, regular things that we can keep supporting ourselves and inputting to, but which other people and organisations and funding mechanisms can take ownership of as well. Those sorts of relationships are key. So I guess what I'm talking about here is a mixed economy of combining uh, core funding, money raised, local partnerships, and doing work in kind, giving in kind. And I'm talking from here, but this, again, I think this is nothing unique in this. Many, many organizations are thinking like this. We are trying to work towards a culture, a culture of co-creation that is relevant and responds to the needs, interests, and ambitions of all people. The artists, the content, the buildings, the people um, are a key to this, and the civic responsibility we hold in relation to that is critical as well. And there are lots of good provocations coming from funders around these things whether it's trusts and foundations such as the Gil Gilbankian, uh, Paul Hamlin, from our funders as well. So just to, to sum up, I'm minded to say, dare I say like David Shrigley, that the world can be a better place through experiencing art and culture. But if culture and creativity does not make a positive difference to society, uh, to people and to people's lives, then this, has to be made, this case has to be made more effectively with decent evidence. Or does it? By doing that, are we losing, uh, are we losing uh, the risk that goes with art for art's sake? Are we paralyzing ourselves through over-accountability to all these things we're trying to achieve and dare I see all the things I've just said? As we grapple with these things, an incredible num number of new art centers, galleries, um, venues are going up around the world and often from one funder and often they're struggling to fill what goes into those things because they've got the building, it represents something to them but they're not sure what the content is. Mm. So let's keep celebrating, amplifying our great art forms and traditions. Let's keep disrupting and developing them and taking risks. Let's not compromise our ambition for culture with this, but let's not assume that this ambition can be realized through one organization or one source funding it. It's a joint effort, it's relationship building, and out of that we can keep developing a new type of ecology and virtuous so 
that helps us to keep developing our arts and cultural traditions. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank, thanks, John. Uh, that was really useful. And I, certainly, there's a few things there that I'm going to pick up and kind of really dig deeper into. But, Barb, your, your thoughts, please. Everything that's been said is, uh, is spot on, I'd say. Um, but I think it's complex, and I think it's complex from everybody's point of view. So I'd like to talk about it from the point of view of somebody who receives funding and somebody who applies for funding and somebody who does those projects in the community and how we get that funding and how that reflects on, for example, how we'd look at funding in other areas for other forms. So um, I'm going to start with this, which is on the wall of the Kennedy Centre, and it's JFK. 1963 speech at Amherst College. I think it's it's opposite. I look forward to an America which will reward achievement in the arts as we reward achievement in business or statecraft. I look forward to an America which will steadily raise the standards of artistic accomplishment and which will steadily enlarge cultural opportunities for all of our citizens. And I look forward to an America which commands respect throughout the world, not only for its strength, but for its civilization as well. And I think those links will come up again and again. Culture and civilization. These things are linked at a really basic level. If we, if we forget that, I think we forget it at our peril. So I started to work in, um, Sean, you were talking about people and places, in people and places scheme. Um, is, is relevant to this. I started to work in what is called a cultural, I think they're called cultural dark spots or cultural grey spots. They're essentially places in the country where, um, where, where there's huge economic deprivation. And um, this was, to be specific, Corby. So I started to work in Corby something like eight years ago. And I was asked to write a song cycle by a private sponsor. So here's our mixed arts right there. Somebody said, I will give you this amount of money to do a local song cycle because Corby needs some pride. It's going down the toilet. So I started to work with local musicians. We started to gather people. And it happened to be around the time of the Queen's visit to Corby, for which an RPO element was introduced and uh, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, and, uh, and a, a choir was put together, and I do mean put together quickly, like over the space of two weeks, a choir was formed. And, and it was great, and the Queen came, and the song was sung, and everybody was happy, and we had this choir, which then didn't have any function. So the whole point of my being invited to make this song cycle was, could we go back to the community and start work with a choir. So we did, we formed a choir. We formed a choir, we put on a concert of these songs and that was the end of that bit of money. So we thought, where are we going to go? So we looked around for local sponsors. Well, in Corby, local sponsors were very thin on the ground because people are scrabbling to live. So, uh, and this choir was fantastic. People were saying, I can't believe it. I'm finding new things in my own environment. People started to discuss things from the songwriting. We started to have a debate about Corby and its history. So we applied to the Arts Council. And that became a relationship that went for about five years. And during which time, every single time we applied to the Arts Council, we had to come up with some brilliant new idea that somehow ticked all the buzz boxes for the Arts Council that year, not knowing whether the person who'd seen our work last year and thought it was brilliant and we must carry on with it, not knowing whether they were still in their job. We didn't know who would be asking the questions, we didn't know who would be making the judgments. And then people and places happened. This massive amount of money, millions and millions, for cultural dark spots of Britain. Corby's a dark spot. There's nothing happening there. People are desperate. We put in. And they said yes. But only if 
we did a collaboration which involved world excellent people. So great, we've got a relationship with the Royal Philharmonic. The Royal Philharmonic have to justify their money by having relationships with people in cultural dark spots. You're getting this? So they were great, we'll do that, wonderful, yeah. So now we've got them, we've got this. Can we do it in the football ground? The football ground isn't a concert <laughs> ground but could we build a concert space in the football ground? Yes, because you can do anything if you need that money. You can do anything. <laughs> yes, we could. So we said yes. Then the money became in this sort of stasis place because in order for us to have it, there had to be a body in Corby to administrate it. Mm. And there wasn't. So a body had to be found in a nearby town. You, honestly, you can't make this up. <laughs> and so now we have a relationship with a nearby town, which isn't the town we're in, to administer the money. But we met with them, and they didn't seem to understand what we were doing, or indeed why we were doing it. So all of this happened. Then we had to fund people in administration jobs from the money we'd got. So, the, the, the machinery of this was endless and fantastic. And at the end of it, a concert was made. And at the end of it, it was fabulous. And at the end of it, Corby was proud. And that funding process continues and continues. But my point, I guess, is that these funding mechanisms are not simple. And that for all of us who are involved with them, Every time we go about applying for them, we have to do things that fit their remit. That is not necessarily the remit of the art. If we're clever, we find a way of fitting the remit of the art to their remit to get the money to be able to do them. And that's the same for art throughout history. So, artists go to wherever they can get the money. I work a lot in America, and interesting in America, I see it, interesting in America is this whole notion of patronage. Patronage in America works completely differently, and it works because people get tax breaks for it. So, and there is an, and there is an anticipation that if you have, you will support. If you are cultured and you have, you will support. So you do support by, for example, subsidising a series of concerts. The return of that is that whoever you are subsidising those concerts for will bring you into the organisation, will host you at dinners, will introduce you to composers, will give you something back. There is a sense of reciprocity which we haven't got. So whilst I absolutely agree we need lots of ways of funding, I don't even think there's a question about should we fund the arts, of course we should. I, can't, I, I, I mean, if you, think, if, if you think not, I can't wait to hear. But the question of where that funding comes from, we have to have huge changes in our society and government in order to make those things work. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, that, was a, that, that story of Corby is brilliant, isn't it? Because it absolutely, anyone who's ever been there know exactly what you meant, but it was Thank brilliantly you. explained. Uh, thanks very much, Alexander. If you had crossed <clears throat> northern Germany in 1500, the first you would have seen of a town would have been a church spire. The church, cathedral, monastery, and nunnery were concrete expressions of people's values. These buildings marked popular consent that God existed and that the institution of the church would mediate between people and God. There could have been no more stable, important, and fundamental aspect to community life than the church. It seemed an enduring covenant. Then, in 1517, Martin Luther nailed his theses to the door of Witt and Wittenberg Cathedral. And within a lifetime, the Catholic Church had been practically erased from all of Northern Europe. What happened, because of Luther's objections, reflected widespread public anger at the clergy's corruption, insularity, arrogance, hypocrisy, and self-serving behavior. The population believed in the creed and the function of the church, but not its personnel and practices. We sit today, as clergy and congregation, in one of the high cathedrals of publicly funded arts. Don't assume this will last forever. There is a gulf between the, the beliefs and priorities of ordinary people who fund the arts and the elite who benefit from the arts funding as the primary producers, consumers and administrators of publicly funded arts. Uh, childless individuals fund schools. Healthy people fund the NHS. Deaf people fund orchestras. However, what you don't find in schools, hospitals and concert halls is overt political propaganda belittling your mainstream views in favour of patriotism, 
Christianity, Brexit, and your scepticism towards multiculturalism, transgenderism, mass migration, and abortion, and pushing agendas which range from the trite and self-indulgent to patronizing and demeaning. How much longer do we expect the population to fund such tendencies? We've reached a turning point. If the publicly funded contemporary arts do not reform themselves, they will be reformed, perhaps reformed out of existence. The status quo cannot lo can no longer be an option. That was really interesting because Tiff, at the beginning, reminded us to talk about the content. And I think that that is something that sometimes gets lost in a different conversation, what is funded and so on. And um, later on today, I'm doing an in-conversation with uh, Julie Birchall and Jane Robbins about Brexit on the stage. They've written a kind of different kind of play. Um, you know, it's Julie Birchall, so you can imagine. But um, the, the point being that there, there is a, a sense in which that gap between the artistic elite and the mass of people is something which at least has been discussed recently, actually in relation to Brexit, but that's not really my point. And yet, as Barber's described, there's also a very real thriving way that you can engage the arts with people, but it's not all, they're not always married, those two discussions. So just in terms of that box ticking exercise, but also the kind of the, the, the dilemmas that Sean described as running an institution, but also the things which I think Alexander's usefully raised as, you know, don't take yourself for granted. You could be the old Catholic Church, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, yeah, if you kind of just sit there and assume that you are entitled, it won't necessarily work. Any, any thoughts? I think it wouldn't be a terrible thing if you got rid of arts funding for a little while. Um, and I say ooh, that as a passionate ooh. supporter, because I think there's a kind of, despite all the talk of public engagement and democratisation that you've had for a good 30 years now, I think you've seen a distancing, really, of art from the people. Um, they, they still go in, in large numbers, but there's, in some ways, a kind of... There's a socialisation agenda, and one example I would give is Manchester taking off uh, from public display the nymphs, the Victorian nymphs, to start a conversation about what was appropriate to show. So it's a silly example in one way, but I think in another, in another it suggests that actually when arts organisations talk, and I, this is obviously sweeping, Sean, and I think the Barbican's brilliant, but in many cases when, when arts organisers and funders talk about the public, they do it in a very alienated, uh, distant way. So there would be a case for saying, well, take the art to the people and see if they'll fund it. I mean, Barb's example is a really an interesting one. It was done in the name of the people, but it was nothing to do with them in the way. It was other people deciding what hoops they would jump through to engage with the people. And it might just be, and I say this as somebody who's desperate for money as a, as a writer often, is that maybe it should just go to the public and see if you can make the case for it. Sean, uh, your immediate thoughts on that? I think there is a need for the conversation to change and how arts organisations or cultural organisations engage with that. I think language and everything that goes with that is, is, a, is a tricky thing. I think the intention is right, but it, the premise upon which it is working is perhaps based on older models. And the two things, it goes back to what you were saying, there are two things almost working in parallel here. Whether we should remove the funding or not, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll <laughs> hold say that on that. As somebody who doesn't get but it, so. I, I do think these provocations are needed. What you've just said, and I thought that was excellent. What you said, and I'm not just saying that. That is the type of conversation we need to be having. It goes back to your echo chamber point at the beginning of the day. Yeah, I think as well, Bob. One of the things I was thinking when you were talking was that I, I think it was that your attempt at second guessing what somebody else would want you to do in order to get the money. Mm -hmm. now, I mean. <laughs> God, I know what that's like. Um, and that's not from the arts, but anyone who's worked in any kind of small organisation knows. But I think with the arts, what then happens is there is a corrupting influence. And you, you said eventually you can get it to work, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I've seen, and I'm sure you're aware of, projects where the, the artistic outcome changes because of that. And it's interesting because all the fuss is about we can't be funded by big corporates because they might interfere in the artistic uh, freedom and corrupt us. But th often those very people have jumped through so many hoops that you end up with a complete, all the ones actually are setting the hoops. Um, you just think, well, that wasn't what we started off. Oh, you wanted to have a 
choir in Corby, by the way, as an aside, you know what I mean, to sing some songs. We didn't necessarily want to do, 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 do. And sometimes people don't hold truth to even, is that, I mean, is that kind of the danger here? And, and what, what do you think about TIFF's provocation? Maybe we should kind of dispense with the public funding. Well, I think several things. <laughs> Let's start with what the people want, because that's always the really interesting. What do the people want? Just to, to go back to people and places, the people were canvassed and, um, and their responses were analysed. And what the people wanted was some art. They wanted all different kinds of art, actually. And, and some, of, some of the things they wanted were uh, very obvious and some were not. But there's something that I'd like to say about the funded arts that I think hasn't been said, which is that the funded arts are one of the ways that, particularly in terms of the theatre, practitioners, and I, by this I mean people who work behind the stage, people who work in lighting and design, learn their craft. They don't learn that craft on the stage necessarily at the mm. Barbican, Sean, I know no, we, no. we get no. those people come up through small theatres that, that they're able to get jobs in. So our, our major world-class arts at the bottom up, that educational process is enhanced by subsidised theatre, which is not subsidised theatre, the nature of, for example, the Opera House, it's subsidised theatre, which is little tiny theatres that operate in funny little rural areas or towns where there's nothing else. And those theatres and spaces are performing something that it would be difficult to find without some kind of money. So I think that the take away the funding argument is really interesting when you see how it impacts on not just the things we're talking about at the highest level, but at the very bottom. There are some things that are affected there that we don't know what the outcome of that would be, but I, I'm, I think, surprising. Just finally, before going out, um, Alexander, I recognised your, your point. I think that, that one of the things that has become apparent amongst some people in the arts, at least, is I, I don't want to get stuck on Brexit, but I'm just going to use it because you can't avoid it. But if you've got 96% of the arts population who say that they, that, that they were, you know, were uh, voted um, Remain, which is perfectly legitimate, but then sort of being abhorred at everybody else uh, not doing that, some of the arts conversations that happened after that, which were really interesting, was we've got to listen more, but we've also got to go out and do art in these dark spots. I mean, that's not what you were talking about, but in these dark spots, so that they can be educated, so they won't make that mistake again. So it was one of those kind of like, it wasn't, you thought, well, that's a bit of humility. Having said that, and, and, and you're right, you know, sometimes you feel that artistic missionary work to dark spots is about lecturing people about why their values are wrong and kind of introducing them to arts to civilize them I mean, it's literally got that quality to it having said that it would also be wrong to say that the art should necessarily go out and accommodate just to what people already think because that wouldn't seem to be right either i mean surely one would want to challenge those values that people hold dear whoever they are. I mean, that can be North London liberal elites, all right, all right. But it can also be anyone else, right? I mean, you can't just kind of go, oh, we'll give you the art you want. I know you weren't saying that, but do you want to try and untangle that a bit for me? Uh, what's remarkable about the arts is that you enter these galleries, you enter these um, venues, and you don't see any representations, contemporary representations of positive responses to Christianity, patriotism, pro-Brexit feelings, um, you know, scepticism towards those things that are, are held dear by the elite. Um, and it's as if you've walked into a parallel universe where those, those views simply do not exist. It's not a question of having them displayed proportionately. It's just I've never seen those things in a contemporary setting. And so I feel that the uh, middle class, university educated, uh, left leaning, um, city dwelling people who are the main consumers, producers, and administrators of art have built an art world that is completely in their uh, image and that you have an absolute absence of alternative views. And it's also a question of um, uh, considering that those views are illegitimate. It's not just that we don't want to see them and we don't want them in our venues, but we don't want them there because they're not legitimate. You cannot legitimately be a patriot because that is, that is sort of co-equal with being a chauvinist or a nationalist or so on. Okay, so I, 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 there'll, there'll be disagreements on the panel on, on this one. And also, 
I'm aware of the fact that what we haven't discussed, and people can raise it if they want, is also, you know, commercial art that does well. I mean, I, I was going to say about Barb, I mean, she's talked about particular projects, but her career is you going out and doing the hard graft of selling tickets and selling CDs as well, because it's merited. But in a way, there is a kind of, you know, if they're any good and worthwhile, people buy them. You know what I mean? Or, and you have to kind of... So a lot of arts organisations don't have that kind of pressure or don't or, or haven't. They now do, because I think everyone does. But it's not always the case. Right, hands in the air, anyone? Who wants to speak? I find the discussion, which was briefly touched upon, about um, corporate sponsorship of art really, really fascinating. Um, I think it's one that I think misses a nuance. Um, often there's objection to, say, BP sponsoring art um, because they're viewed as unethical. But I think there's a real paradox between, between art, which is touched upon being something that's really fundamental to the human experience, and business models that um, threaten the human experience. And I think that's a real nuance and a paradox that isn't actually touched upon very much in this debate. Mm. And I guess um, I find it really hard to reconcile those two things, so I'd be interested to hear the panel's views on that, especially given that if we're talking about the importance of human experience, I don't think you can just limit it to art, you have to think about it broadly. Hi, um, my question was around um, that kind of question of meeting the tick boxes for funding. One that can come up is, you know, what are the economic benefits of uh, this cultural thing that you're trying to do? Um, which is obviously uh, very difficult to evidence, I think. Um, and also kind of misses the point that everyone's been talking about around, you know, the benefits to the community, well-being, mental health, that sort of thing. So I was just curious on your views on the balance between sort of accepting the reality of that funder's requirements and trying to meet those versus strongly opposing and saying, well, that's really missing the point. OK, thank you. I'm glad Tiffany started with um, capturing the experience of, I suppose, the magic of art, and I think that's really valuable. But I do also think that the opportunity for participation and involvement is really important. And I think we have to think about the whole ecology of the arts, but also of education, of community. So it's not, I don't feel it's just about arts funding. I think it's about funding across society as well. And I think this is why the mixed economy is actually really vital. Uh, from my perspective, I always think that a lot of the most innovative and interesting art comes in from the margins, from youth clubs, from people's garages. It's not just about the big institutions, and I think that's why that wider funding and participation is important. Not just as, I think it's Alexander, things that will be done to people or to box tick, but because that's where there's a lot of vibrancy and life and uh, people start making things happen. And as for the thing about people not knowing what they want, a lot of innovative art that has been, um, was actually ridiculed and... Uh, disliked in its day because it didn't reflect the times. And I think it's important to allow that. Mm. My worry about sponsorship is that I think it does have the um, danger of neutering art in that people end up self-censoring. It takes very brave sponsors and funders, and I think this is an ongoing debate, to allow artists the freedom to express themselves and talk about the stories that they'd like. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, as an um, uh, older woman living in East London, I go to 50 events every day that are run by small arts organisations. Um, often they will bribe you to go there with a free lunch or something like that, or um, it's usually about reminiscence or identity or something like that. Uh, and the point is it displaces ordinary activities. So, for example, our church, when we're looking for someone to visit the sick or clean the church or something like that. People are too busy doing this often nonsense, meaningless stuff to prop up a middle class who are just earning, earning a living because they can't do an ordinary job. And we're often being used as extras. And I feel we should be, we people, we should be paid <laughs> to do this work ourselves because we have to sit through an awful lot of rubbish. <laughs> God, that has to go down as the best contribution of the day, <laughs> doesn't it? I love that. Extras. Uh, there is a bit of that, Sean, which you might, you might want to kind of reflect on as well, because I have sometimes thought, I mean, you, I, not that you do it. No, but I mean, the institutions, there is a kind of thing about, you know, dragoon in the local schools. Do you know what I mean? I mean, there, are, there is that kind of thing of, oh, we need some inner city black youth to, in, you know, um, let, let's go out and get a school. 
and then offer them free tickets. And then we need some, you know, as you say, elderly local East London people who can come in for the free lunch and so on and so forth. It's not necessarily what we kind of mean by community involvement, but it's definitely got the, some truth to that. Something like the, um, like the Sackler wing, of which there are a few. I mean, that they directly make the opioids that, no, no. that you know, causing tens of thousands of deaths in America. And it's something I, I just feel quite uncomfortable being in a space viewing the art that's sort of funded them that way. Manik Govinda, I used to work in the art sector uh, for <laughs> 30 <laughs> years, and now uh, I think uh, Barb's uh, story is so uh, astute. Um, you find in uh, funding, uh, public funding, um, ERD, European Regional Development Funds, Creative Europe, Arts Council funding, you know, layers and layers of professionalisation of administrators and very little money actually goes to the artists and, um, and the production. Um, so I think it's a very, very important point. Um, what I would like to um, tease out are, are these, uh, these cathedrals of culture uh, in, in these kind of cold spots uh, that you know, you're talking about, so um, where hardly anyone actually goes to them. So Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, you know, I can uh, happily say, having spent two days there once, um, you can see the tumbleweed, you know, uh, uh, rolling just uh, outside it. And, and the only time it was actually busy was um, when uh, they would have a refugees communal lunch um, and suddenly everyone would come in for free lunch and then it would empty by two o'clock. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a building that's uh, a lottery funded pr program, uh, uh, millions of pounds. Um, and when you speak to the people that work there, you know, they, they almost look in a sense of disdain about the majority of people who voted to leave the EU. Mm. Um, you know, they don't, they're, they're sort of almost, then, they're, you know, that set of the community, they're not interested in. Uh, what they do want to privilege are uh, asylum seekers and refugees and uh, so a community garden project, a communal lunch project, you know, but there's no engagements with what I saw was a, you know, a, 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 an interesting and not very good piece of you know, a highly conceptualized art um, 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 uh, exhibition installation. Um, and you know, this kind of fawning over to um, reach out to certain sectors of, of communities and, and ignore the vast majority of others who, who probably just think that money shouldn't be spent there. You know, there, there needs to be that kind of democratic conversation, in my, from my point of view, about um, where funding goes. And not to say that, you know, that will just fund, you know, very kind of uh, traditional projects. Um, uh, I still believe that money should go there for the experimental and uh, the unusual. Um, but, you know, to have a conversation about that is so important, and I think the public is completely divorced from that debate. So that's a point I just want to get people to consider. Okay, great. Thank you. That was really interesting. Sean. So I'd, I think just one thing, just stepping back for a moment, is I think one reason I moved from being a musician, an artist, doing a lot of the sorts of projects, not quite to the scale you talked about, Beth, was I, I, loved, I loved the work and still do a little bit, I do of it, but I got increasingly frustrated at this, you, this seemed to be the cycle that you were describing and there was no way of shifting it. Mm -hmm. So I found myself moving into organisations to try and start to influence. Now that's not a one-man show, show at all and it, there's a lot, warts and all, there's a lot of things that still aren't right. But I do think there is a genuine shift in the mindset now, or a real, I'd say there's a realisation that people have got to shift in how they think about these things. And some of the, the points being made about how we engage with schools or community mm. young people, it is no longer acceptable uh, for an arts organisation like the Bible, or anyone, to go out and say, we've got this great project or this great piece, we're going to put it in your school or just bring you in and here it is. Yeah. I think there's, there's this interesting discourse, I think, between um, efforts on our part, whether it's what we programme or the type of community and outreach work we do, that just amplifies what we do already. It's almost just trying to re restate what we are what we do it's not to say there's no value in our traditional culture and art it is wonderful but how we use our resources and what we invest in mm. needs to be thought in in different ways and i think the way we use resources and investment whether the arts continue to be funded or not needs to move more and more into the sense of co-creation in the border not just in terms of co-creating work but in terms of anything that's development it is developed comes from the public, from the communities themselves, through the sorts of consultations you were describing, as much as what we want to programme from our side. Mm. 
And dare I say, as always, it's not, I don't think it should be an either or. The two things can work together and should do. Going back to that, whether funding should go completely, that sort of injection shock treatment, whether that happens or not, and whether that becomes a reality, and I think things will change. I think I mentioned the Gilbenkian earlier. They had a, have had a very good provocation about the civic role of arts centres and organisations in the future, with the, dim, the diminishing number of public spaces available generally in the country. What role can and should organisations and spaces like this play in relation to that? Um, but what I would say is core funding resource um, investment into the arts is diminishing. We are having to model things on the, on the assumption that it's going to keep going down. And that makes us think differently, creatively, and make sure that we work on the basis of building relationships rather than just doing what we do anyway. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, I would say that there's a, I think there's a problem when we direct a lot of our funding towards the demographics. I mean, as, as the lady said, you know, that um, certain people are brought in, sort of farmed in, so that the uh, administrators can tick a certain number of boxes. We've got this certain number of senior citizens, we've got this number of Afro-Caribbeans, we've got this number of and um, I think it's a rather gruesome way of going about programming the arts. It's also quite dehumanising and patronising when you're just looking at people's skin colour or you're just looking at their gender and so on. I think, that's, um, I think that, that's quite destructive. And when you have arts funding which is geared towards, because uh, all arts organisations have these targets now, whether or not they'll admit them. Most local councils have them. Uh, most arts organisations, central arts organisations like the Arts Council, keeps very detailed records of who's going to these exhibitions and who's participating in art projects. And if you're looking at things in demographic terms of your audience and also now in terms of your producers or performers, um, you're actually embedding identity politics into your arts funding. And there is no way out of it because this has become part of the profit incentive. And if you're seen to have sort of be losing some minority visitors, you're, you're sort of classed as failing and there'll be sort of, there'll be a move to uh, introduce sort of more gay events or whatever, I don't know. I think this is quite, um, quite an unpleasant and distasteful way of uh, organising arts funding. I wonder if it's changing or, because Sean, you've made the point, I mean, this is, this is, I don't know if it's changing or not. I mean, I did have a terrible experience once, the only time that I got close to Arts Council money. But I blew it. But the, I blew it because they basically asked me what the uh, ethnic uh, breakdown of the audience would be. And I said, I don't know. And, I've never, and I don't want to think about it. I mean, it's, it felt... I mean, I said, oh, I don't know. We're going to put on these debates on theatre and we're going to hope we get lots of people to them. And, um, and they kept saying, well, what do you mean you haven't thought? I mean, I said, well, I don't... I, I, it's the quality of the work. Now, we weren't an arts organisation, but, but I, on the other hand, I also know that some of those things become slightly exaggerated tales. And I know that there are people in arts funding who try not to do that now. So I, I, I can't decide myself whether that conversation is changing a bit. Part of the catch-22 there is if we're going to break out of being a middle-class arts thing, it shouldn't be determined by just box-ticking like that. But there is a genuine will to make whatever is created or happened in these organisations to be for everyone, to coin the phrase. So it, it, somehow we've got to break out of that so that we can genuinely reach other people. I, I want to start by saying, um, I want to go back to Corby, I'm sorry, but I do. Uh, because Corby, when it had a steelworks, was largely Latvian and Scottish in demographic. And they had regular visits from the Halle Orchestra. They had the, a, little, a little hall. And the Halle Orchestra came every time they toured, and a bunch of other orchestras came. When we went into them as a, and when we say this dark spot thing is economic, can I just make that really clear? Nobody was ever saying people in Corby have no artistic appreciation or don't know what good art is or any of those things. What they were saying was people in Corby have no longer any access to any arts because all the things that were coming there were no longer coming there. So that's number one, and I think that's a really important point, actually, because this is a lot of it about the economic status of a place and not people determining that other people have got some sort of cultural need because they simply don't understand culture, nor is it in any way a class thing because the Corby people, who are very class conscious, are also very culture conscious. So I, I think there's a bigger... I think there's a bigger... Um, a bigger argument here about 
what we're thinking of when we, when we talk about engagement. So to come back to things that are sponsored, I'd like to say, look at Cardboard Citizens. These are, this is a theatre group that has worked with homeless people for a very long time and do fantastic work and have a social function which isn't about the social function it's about doing art doing theater work with homeless people that's it that's their remit that's what they do they do that they pull it off and the work's terrific um, by lots of people's standards not just mine gray eye chicken shed work with disability liz carr who's on silent witness is somebody who came up through chicken shed and through the work that was funded there in order to give her her dramatic her dramatic training and she's now on mainstream television so there are so many things that I, this, the nuance of the money is really interesting does 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 money have morality if the cigarette company comes to us and says we'll give you the money you need and there are no strings attached do we take it i think that's a massive the the saudi one is huge where would we go with that right now i don't know what i'd say to that if that was the thing on the table for us mm -hmm. sean if that was the question we'll give you the money do you want it in case the saudis are watching i'll have it mm -hmm. but do you see what i mean it's a they're they're, they're it's not none of this is no. simple no Yes, let's, let's talk about the corporate sponsorship because I think that is, the, that is really um, bearing upon arts organisations at the moment. The Saudi, probably more than the SACLA, but the SACLA funds, the V&A, the Met, uh, major organisations, and Nan Golden, the artist, is uh, protesting and trying to get them to basically withdraw their funds. I think throughout history, dubious organisations and people have funded the arts. In fact, there's been a kind of very strong relationship between them. You just uh, people always talk about the Medici, but the Medici and the G and Getty, they, mm. these people were not nice. They were not they were not nice people, and they probably had strings. It may have been kind of self glorification. Put me in your picture, make me look good. Um, artists yes. were able to get around it to a degree. I think um, I would like to see that continue, and I think. The reason is I do think the arts need the money and they can't just get it from the state and they can't just get it from the public. That's why you have a multiplicity, multiplicity of funding. Um, I think in this present climate as well, I, I worry about that kind of moralism um, where people come in and say, you know, BP is a, almost, BP is a legitimate organisation. Um, and I worry about the targeting of arts organisations in that kind of moralistic way. I think the interesting thing about the National History Museum this week is uh, Owen Jones, the Guardian journalist, was trying to get them to uh, disown a corporate function funded by the Saudis. Um, they didn't. They said it was a commercial. Uh, they needed the money. I mean, it's a commercial, it's nothing to do with the exhibi exhibition programming. And you always have to have that kind of fractious relationship with your sponsor, which is like, no, we don't want to do that. No, we don't want to do that. But he then pointed to their ethics guidance, which basically said, we'll do everything good and we won't do anything nasty and we're cleaner than clean. And I think institutions have been um, almost asking for that kind of scrutiny. Um, and not standing up, I think the way in which the BM and the Tate have kind of not vocally defended BP sponsorship is not only short-term foolish, but I think it's, it's long-term. Um, they, they ask for more kind of criticism. I just want to say something on participation Quick, yeah. really quickly, which is that you always have to ask participation in what? What are people being asked to participate in? A lot of these art galleries have nothing in them. I mean, Sean mentioned this at the beginning. There's a new art gallery opening called The Shed in New York. They don't know what to put in it. Um, they're leaving a little bit late, I would say. And if you go to places like Margate, has got the uh, uh, gallery there. I, I'm all for that gallery being there. But it's almost like an easy jet experience for people. You get them in. They have, you know, the walls are now all kind of bruised with the bags and the... The feet, I mean, it's just not taken care of. The quality, the artwork's not there. So they may talk about democratisation and access, but access to what? What are people being given? It's not very good quality. I, just, I went to the British Museum on a sleepover with my nine-year-old niece, and it's great. You get to sleep amongst the artefacts, but they didn't tell you anything about them. There were all these kind of cut and paste. I mean, I know she's only nine, but we could have had a kind of conversation about Ramesses. 
apart from the fact that, that it makes you feel good seeing beautiful things, listening to music, somehow it's deep within us because the cavemen were doing paintings on the walls. Maybe it was religious, maybe it was to help their hunting. They found flutes from that Stone Age. People have that in them. Young children, my, I've got four grandsons, they love colouring, they love drawing, they love singing, they like performances, they love charades. And somehow it gets knocked out of you somewhere along the line. <laughs> and it's, the trouble is people think it's elitist. But, people, but I remember when I was quite little, my mother's cleaner um, thought we were a bit snobby going to the things we went to. And she saw the film Carmen Jones and she said, now that's a good musical. So it, we shouldn't be elitist. And you can get... You don't have to even have a lot of money. I've been for four pounds at the back of Covent Garden for a performance, and then the Guildhall School of Music and Drama has lovely freebies going. So how do we get... Um, what I'm looking at is, it, it, how do, wh where are we going wrong? How can we link all this underlying uh, basis and, and enthusiasm and put it in context? Oh, yeah, so just um, in terms of arts and education, I go to a grammar school where... About half of the students in sixth form take maths and a tiny percentage take the arts. And I feel like in the modern day even more, there's a massive drive towards scientific pro uh, progress and technological progress. And it almost comes to a point where that progress is just progress for progress's sake. Um, and do you think in the future there'll ever be a point where we realise what we actually want to get out of that progress and whether that will see a turn towards... Um, well, it turns towards more funding and more availability of the arts, because in a way, that's um, what makes people, in, that's what people enjoy doing. And okay. so, I, yeah, I suppose my question is just in the future, um, where do you see the balance of arts and of science going, and will we ever reach a point where we realise the true value of art in that sense? Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Just very quickly, I wanted to come back on, on something that this lady said down here, uh, just uh, to... to speakers ago and also um, just sort of generally from the discussion it was interesting that um, Tiffany when she uh, opened her remarks she talked about um, the importance that art plays in uh, uplift I think was the word that you used and giving us solace you know two very therapeutic categories if I could just uh, point that out and you know a lot of the discussion about the content of art or the type of art that's being uh, funded uh, does seem to revolve around the effect that art has on its audience, whether that's in terms of how it makes you feel or whether that's in terms of the kind of messages that it's a conduit for and whether it's a, the, those are the right kind of messages or they're democratic or not. And I just wanted to sort of step back a bit and say perhaps neither of those approaches are right and perhaps one of the problems with the kind of uh, ongoing kind of utilitarian approach to the arts is precisely this idea that art needs to have, you know, we value art by its effect on the, on, the, the, on the viewer, on the subject, however that's defined, rather than allowing people to engage with art on terms that are intrinsic to the art itself, in art terms, aesthetically, and that through that we can somehow transcend our particular positions as members of this social group or that social group. So Alexander, give us your final thought, please. We can only guarantee um, substantial funding for the contemporary arts if venue managers, um, producers and consumers keep their politics out of our venues. Very good final thought. Bob. Um, OK, I'm going to pick up on that uh, point about everything changing in a society where possibly lots of people will not have jobs. I would like to see art centres on the corner of every street offering every single person the chance to do photography, drama, whatever it is they want to do with whoever they'd like to do it with as much as they'd like to do it. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, Sean? We need a, a new ecology and a new conversation around the role of arts in society, and that includes arts organisations and conservatoires and universities who are training artists to come out. And I think what you've just said is exactly what we uh, should be working towards. Okay, brilliant, thank you. On art and science, 
just to open a complicated subject, I think they're both truth orientated and both are hampered in the contemporary climate where they have to kind of prove themselves and are unable to be more open. I think art is a kind of subjective truth, human condition. Uh, science is obviously something that is replicable, but both actually suffer from a climate of high, low horizons. On what about the fact that we've been created art, creating art um, all our human history, I think that's why we should be optimistic. Um, I think there's something really in that. It's not something that we absolutely have to fund. I think we should, but I think we encourage people to um, go forth and be artistic. There's an exhibition here at the moment called Modern Couples. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I urge you to go see it. It's, it's exhilarating and highly frustrating. Alexander, I think you'll hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so it begins by saying they're trying to dethrone the male artist, um, that it's female-centred uh, curation. There's more text in the Bible. It's a huge amount of text. It's extremely kind of politicised and very annoying. But it's also um, 40 couples, whether it's Duchamp or Picasso or Kandinsky or Klimt, um, and the art that they created together. Um, and it's very sexy and it's very exhilarating. Uh, Lee Miller, all the rest of it. But there, there's a couple uh, and their male lover uh, called Pajama, and they were. It, this was when they were gay, and you couldn't really exhibit your own photographs in 1950s New York during that time because you couldn't be gay publicly. And they went up and they took these amazingly erotic, beautiful photographs of nude men on the beach and their isolated figures, and they did that off their own backs. And now their art is testament to um, the fact that it's found a space. So I think there will be always people trying to create art, even if they're in exhibitions that are also slightly annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Backhanded compliment for the Barbican there. Go and see the exhibition. Can we give our, our panel a round of applause?